The last two years between cancer and the COVID restrictions, we've spent a lot of time indoors. And Tim, even though he has always been a voracious reader, has sort of redoubled his efforts. So I thought it might be interesting for me as well as everybody else to get him to talk about some of the best things that he's been reading. This is only a fraction of Would you believe I read these yesterday? <laughs> no, I wouldn't believe you read them yesterday. Would you believe I've read these over two years? Um, I know that you have read a lot more than those That's over right. two years, but I did ask him to try to um, winnow out the things that he thought might be useful for other people. And this is a selection, admittedly. There's a link in the journal where you can find a longer list in each category. Right. But um, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, the, the, the categories? Books. Well, tell us, when, when you pick up a book, tell us what category you're taking it out okay. of and then right. why it was significant to you, why right. you liked it. And uh, just to uh, uh, add to what Kathy said, what we'll do is I'll, I went through and picked out in these seven categories uh, books that I have read, but I think pr pretty much everybody should read. Uh, I am only going to give you a couple of them from each category, but all of the volumes will be listed and on the more. website. And perhaps that some never more. even made it onto the yeah, table because I, I, and you wouldn't be able to <clears throat> see him if we right. put them all on the table. So this is biblical and theological studies. And I've only got two, even though it's a little bit of a cheat because the first book is a two-volume book. <laughs> you and, only have two you're going to mention. You mean. Well, there's two, only two I'm going to mention. The first one is Justification by uh, Michael Horton. Uh, in fact, this whole series called New Studies in Dogmatics is important. I would go so far as to say this is the most important book written in 100 years on justification. And only re the reason is not that, not that you know, it does, I don't mean that you shouldn't read Luther and Calvin and, and, and all the classics, but what Michael does is, as some of you know, the, uh, the Protestant doctrine of justification has been under a great deal of fire uh, in the last generation. And Michael works on all that. He gives you the history of the doctrine up to the present time. He gives you a, a biblical survey of where, the base of the doctrine. And he answers all the critics. And in the end comes down saying, yeah, the, the Protestant doctrine is right. But he, he gets you there by dealing with all of the various issues and aspects and criticisms. And it's just great. And the second is this is called The Wonderful Works of God by Herman Bobbink. And Herman, I knew Bob Inc. was going to make it yeah, into the he, list. Uh, yeah, only, yeah, well, more than one place. Bob Inc. Um, uh, wrote a massive four-volume, what you would call a systematic theology, but it's actually dogmatics, not exactly the same thing, but we won't go into that. Re he, he wrote his Reformed Dogmatics four volumes. This is a, a synthesis of it. It's written for college-educated, uh, educated lay people, and it's 500 pages, but it is just terrific. Should I keep going? Oh, please do. What's the next category? Biblical and theology. This is a Christian critique of and analysis of culture. Just going to give you three here. Um, trying to understand. You're just going to mention three. I'm going to mention three. Yeah. Uh, here is a, this is a, um, a book. It's entitled Michel Foucault. And Foucault, along with Karl Marx, is probably one of the most uh, important thinkers affecting progressive, secular ways of thinking today in America. And uh, Christopher Watkin wrote this. It's uh, remarkable because Watkin is a strong Christian and he gives you a very strong biblical critique of Foucault, but he also summarizes his views in a way that's extraordinarily helpful. And I just don't think there's anything quite like this. Uh, can um, I ask a question? Yeah. You're, his, his bottom line though is that Foucault well, it's, it's not. Christian. It's not. He's not endorsing Foucault's thought. He's, no, it's a Christian. He's it's a Christian, criticizing this is, this, Foucault's this, thought. This is a Christian critique of culture. Okay. Well, critique means criticize. Yes. In other okay, words, well, he, in the end, sure. he's going. He, in the end, he's giving a Christian critique, but it's an appreciative. Does he critique. also criticize Marx as well? Uh, he doesn't. Yeah, a little bit. Well, see, Foucault was a critic of Marx, okay. and yet, in the end, uh, as Watkin points out, I think is Foucault in many ways accepted a lot of what Marx said. Ah. So it's a critique of Marx and Foucault, ultimately. So anyone who is unhappy with Foucault and Marx's um, influence on our culture should read that book yes, to see. Be yes, because what, you're, what mostly, okay. mostly Foucault and Marx are just vilified without understanding really what they taught. And if you don't understand what they taught, you can just, you can condemn them, that's terrible. 
but you really don't understand how it's influencing culture. So you don't even really know what to look for. It's very important to yeah, understand. Some of the irony is people are condemning things that they have actually absorbed into the church and yeah. into their own lives without realizing where it came from. Yes, that's why you really have to be thoughtful. I, it's, it, these critiques are important because you're not going to get polluted by them. You know, you know, don't say, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Well, that's you because really they're negative. Need to understand they're not, them. They're not right. endorsing these No, guys. they're not. On the other hand, they are explaining quite well. They're explaining what they actually taught. Um, uh, this is a book called Political Visions and Illusions by David Coises. I recommend this everywhere. He basically takes a look at absolutely every, liberalism, conservatism, socialism, capitalism, every kind of economic and political system and shows that from the biblical point of view, all of them have problems because they all make idols out of something. It, so they, he appreciates these various political views, but he criticizes every one of them and doesn't really think any one of them is per, When you say appreciate, you mean he finds what... What's common, good? What common what's good? grace God has put into and what's bad. them, and yet what where they fail. And he, I don't believe he says everyone is equally good and equally bad. On the other hand, he does say that they're all good and bad. Here's one I just will just mention: uh, Esau Macaulay's book uh, *Reading While Black*. Uh, as a white person, I need to read a lot of books by black authors to understand how, especially Christian black uh, authors, see. What, what is racism in this country? How does the church respond to it? Uh, but there's so many good books, and I actually originally came out here with like seven or eight, and I decided I just don't have time. But this is a great place to start. He's a New Testament professor at Wheaton College. At Wheaton College, yep. And so he, it'd be a of, really good place to start. I have read start. some of his things. He's right. good. He's good. This is apologetics, no, okay. and it'll be faster. Okay. Okay. Uh, Apologetics uh, explained doesn't mean apologizing for being a Christian. <laughs> Some it's, get def that it's called defense of the Christian faith. Okay, okay. Um, probably the um, uh, here's a fast one. Can we trust the Gospels by Peter J. Williams? A probably the best short little book you can read now, most up to date book on why trust that the Gospels are historically reliable. That's enough said. The inerrancy, the it will no. It doesn't go into that. It goes into how do we know whether or not the uh, what the, the the New Testament gospels say is historically reliable? Did Jesus really say these things? Did he rise from the dead? So it's not getting into the doctrine so the of scripture. Accuracy, right? How historically reliable is the text? Right. Uh, this book called Atheist Overreach by Christian Smith is again. It's short. It, I think it's to die for. He basically says very respectfully to atheists, is that individually as atheists you can be wonderfully good people. But if you think atheism gives you any basis for moral values, it doesn't. It fails. It cannot. If you're an atheist and you have moral values, great, he says, I want that, but you're smuggling them in from other ways of thinking about things because your own, he calls it overreach. You actually cannot uh, do a lot of the things you think you can do as an atheist. Very respectful, but at the same time pretty devastating. And this book, Science and the Good, by James Hunter and Paul Nedaleski, basically says science cannot tell you how to live. Science, basically, let me boil it down. I still think you should read it, even though I'm giving you the... Science can tell you what you can do, but never whether you ought to do it. And so the idea that science can tell you how to be happy or how to get purpose in life, and a lot of scientific positive psychology, happiness psychology is supposed to do that, they show how that can't, they can't. Science can never do that. Hang. So, sorry. That's apologetics. Should I go on? Yes, please okay. do. Um, You're only halfway through. Well, yeah, but they can go faster. Uh, Christian worldview. <clears throat> Put it this way. Uh, I believe that when you hear the term worldview today, Christian worldview, you, instead of saying, oh, yeah, I know about that stuff, there are a lot of different approaches to it. I think there's a way to do Christian worldview that's pretty triumphalistic. I have the worldview and you don't. I'm going to take over and do everything according to the worldview. And there's, a pro, there's a, an approach that says, from my Christian worldview, I'm going to do my work in the world for the common good and testify that what I'm doing is coming from Christ. It's, uh, worldview means that you should be distinctively Christian in every area of your life, but your attitude matters. Herman Bovink's book, Christian Worldview, will get you going in that direction. And even, this is not real easy reading, but it's really important reading. And the sequel to it is this book called Philosophy of Revelation. 
So you, if, you, if you work through the both of them, and it takes a little bit of time, but I really recommend it, you'll get a, 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 an approach to a Christian worldview that I think is better probably than any that you have heard. You do not need to be frantically taking notes. These will all be These listed all in be. the link. Devotional reading. Here's, th this is not stuff I've never read before, but uh, I'm just going to bring it up. Uh, John Newton. Uh, if you're going to get... It, John Newton's letters are, are gold. And they are great devotional reading. But I just suggest, and I've had a number of people ask me about this, I suggest starting with this little book, which you can still get. It's a Banner Truth book called The Letters of John Newton. It's my favorite because it's, uh, it's a uh, selection from all the various volumes of his sermons. The one that Kathy lives by is The Utterance of the Heart. You need to know that's only volume one. They published that volume of Utterance of the Heart in two volumes. Yep. If you can find anywhere on... Um, uh, used book sites, the 1979 Baker Bookhouse version <clears throat> ha has a sort of strange yellow and orange cover. That's my favorite. That's the one I used. And it has all of his letters. Right. Uh, it doesn't have all of his letters. Actually, right behind us, the collected works of John Newton, that has all of his letters. But the, the Baker Bookhouse version, any version is fine. John, John right. Newton is Right. He's amazing. He's amazing. And by the way, I shudder, since you know much more about John Newton than I do, to correct you. However, all of his letters are not even in the complete works. Really? They, yeah. They're, they're Why, they call them the complete works? They actually don't. I think they just said the works of. So ah, they weren't, okay. they were being careful. Okay. The other thing is, I would suggest John Owen, another John. Um, you can either read abridged versions of John Owen, like here's the glory of Christ. This oh, is He wrote in English, but then somebody wrote translated in him into English, and that's what that is. He's a 17th century writer, and therefore, whereas you can read John Newton, who's 18th century, and pretty much get it, uh, when you get to the 17th and 16th century, those readers, those writers usually, the English is far enough away that you really need abridgments or modernization. But here's the communion with God with John Owen, glory of Christ with John Owen. His material is... I, I, is, is great. Uh, getting close to the end here. Let me jump to the Wait end. Wait a minute. You, you, you bypassed a, you bypassed All right. a pile. Okay. These are two. How do we understand what's going on in the evangelical church today? And here's two completely different books. One is called The Democratization of American Christianity by Nathan O. Hatch. Recently retired uh, from being president of Wake Forest University. Uh, this is a classic book that talks about how, why actually evangelicalism today is pretty anti-intellectual, frankly. But at the same time, very successful in many ways of reaching, reaching a lot of people. It's a good, you know, it's, it, it's definitely a, a bright side and dark side to evangelicalism, but you, I don't think you can understand modern evangelicalism without reading this book. And then secondly, a completely different book, a book by Brad Vermerlin, who got his PhD under this guy, Christian Smith, professor of sociology at Notre Dame. And what he does there is he talks about, uh, he actually gets into why some churches flourish and why some churches do not in a secular culture. And I'll leave it at that. But he actually talks about how, how can a church, even though it's out of favor with the culture, still grow, you know, ha still have religious strength, he calls it. And um, again, this is an easy reading because it's, he's a historian. <coughs> this is an easy reading because he's a sociologist. But, and finally, um, we're city people and we love talking about the city. And two here's an old and a new book. This is uh, Jane Jacobs, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Now I admit I just reread this, but I'd read it many, many years ago and it was like reading it again. It's a classic. It's, you can't understand American cities anyway without reading this. That's all I'll say. Also, Ed Glazer at Harvard uh, wrote a book about 10 years ago on Triumph of the City, when cities in America were really flourishing. Now, after the pandemic, he's written a new book called The Survival of the City, which shows that cities have been really beaten up by the pandemic. And yet, he's ultimately showing how it's, it's, you know, cities are going to continue to grow and move forward. But it's a really good book for those of you who are living or ministering in cities, or both, and uh, about what some of the challenges we're going to be facing in the future. And that's my seven. Okay. Well, before, before we ask um, Andrew to stop taping, 
These are a lot of books, but they don't represent a tenth of what I know you have read in the last two years. You know, I wouldn't recommend all the books that I've right. read. Right. Sometimes you read a book because you want to know what, I mean, know what your enemies are thinking. You want to know what, um, or okay, the enemy's too strong of a word. You yeah, want to know what the opposition, the opposition is, is and thinking. I don't think and I'd necessarily recommend it yeah, to other people. Yeah, because those take some real sifting. But yep. my point is, what are your reading habits? I mean, I know what some of them are. You don't take the trash down to the trash chute without a book in your hand so that you're not wasting the time walking down the hall and back without reading a book. With that's you. only a minor exaggeration. Yeah, that's not an exaggeration at all. Um, but what are your reading habits so that um, you can actually get this m amount of reading done? I mean, obviously it's been easier since we've been confined. Yes. There haven't been as many. And we're also empty nesters. Thing. And therefore, those of you who've got children at home, like including the person on the other side of the camera there, uh, I don't want to make you feel bad. But basically, you read, this is very, very, this is very conservative. You can read about 200 words a minute. Most, most people can read more, but that's an, a low average. That, and you can usually sit and read um, for maybe 45 to 50 minutes without having to get up or do other things. And so generally speaking, you can read 10,000 words in an hour. And if you can find five hours a week, and the way Kathy and I do it, we like to read right after dinner. Before, if we're going to go back and watch a movie or a BBC murder mystery or something like that, watch the British are always killing each other. It's amazing there's it's, anything, it's amazing anyone there's left on that left island. Britain with, all the, with all the murders. <laughs> But uh, before that, we would read. And you know, it adds up. Then on the weekends, I always try to get a, you know, an hour and a half here, an hour and a half each day. And that's five hours. And you know what that is? That's 50,000 words, which is a short book or, uh, or a book that goes fast. So you can either read in a year, you can read 50 short books or 25 longer books or something in the middle. I probably read. Uh, Probably get more read than that because I'm actually a fast. I'm a faster reader than 200 words a minute. Well, that's so that's how it can be done. Yes. Well, it can also be done if you take books on your vacation. You read them. Right. If you're flying, but, um, you read them. If you're sitting in the beach on the sand, I. But I try to get that five hours a week in. I really do watch that. And by the way, that does mean uh, watching how often you spend time on your phone or or on the, that's it, you know, or just or just. Uh, going on YouTube and watching all the best Willie Mays catches and all the best, you know what I mean? In other words, that will never tempt you. That me, won't but tempt you, but that's the, what, what you've got with the internet is that if you have any, and everybody does, it's something that you just really like, you end up, you know, suddenly an hour, is, suddenly on half an hour yes, is gone. Yes, you can lose a yes, half an hour. That's with, right. So, but reading is what really changes you. Okay. Okay, bear in mind, there will be a link to a list which will include all of the books that Tim talked about, the books that he didn't actually talk about, and then a whole lot of books that aren't even here because truly you wouldn't have been able to see Tim's face if he had piled up all of them. So Which would have Some been of the, a lot better. We, I think Craig and ask uh, if we couldn't put those, those books that will be listed in categories such as the, um, you know, practitioners and, and pastors and general readers yes. and that sort of thing. So, because some of these are more technical and some right. of them are more uh, general. It could be so. that what we'll do is put an asterisk for the ones that are for certain people and other people. But okay. we'll work on it. Okay. Okay. It was great to be with you.